So everybody, welcome to the March webinar, and we're talking about 802.11 alternate phis. And we'll talk about what I mean by alternate phis as we go along today. Of course, as always, you can hashtag CWNP webinar if you're going to tweet about anything we talk about today. And you can follow uh, CWNP on Twitter at CWNP and myself at Carpenter Tom. So those are certainly always something that I recommend and encourage that you do. Now, as we get into today's presentation, I want to give you, first of all, a bit of news. Wi-Fi Trek registration is open, and you can go to conferences.cwnp.com in order to see that. If you are interested and qualified to speak at the conference, there's a call for speakers as well, and I'll give you a brief tour of that site in just a moment. Uh, job task analysis for CWAP and CWDP is happening now in less than two weeks in Vegas. We're very excited about this week-long event. We're going to spend half of the week on CWAP and half of the week on CWDP with a team of seven professionals, subject matter experts in each JTA in order to hammer out exactly what these certifications need to cover. And then content will be developed in the months after that so that by the end of summer, we're likely to see these certifications available. Available. Certainly, by the time of Wi-Fi Trek, certifications will be available, uh, courses and so forth. So the CWAP and CWDP boot camps at Wi-Fi Trek will be the brand new courses based on the brand new certification exams. Additionally, partial coverage of today's topics can be found in our CWS, CWT, and CWNA learning materials with much more info on other topics as well. So this would include live classes with instructors as well as e-learning and so forth. Now. We are going into a bit more depth in a couple of areas than we do in CWNA on these alternate phis, simply because I wanted to take you a little bit deeper into some of the concepts, but that information is likely to end up in uh, DP and or AP as well. So uh, very quickly, let me take you on a brief tour of the conference website. So I'm only going to spend about 60 seconds or so on this. And we can know that by the countdown timer in the upper right corner if I've succeeded or not. So the first thing you'll notice when you get here is something we've done for you this year is justify your attendance. To make it easier for you when you apply for approval to be able to attend the conference, you have a form letter that's ready for you to modify for internal use. We've also provided an Explore San Diego section, so you can find out a little bit about the venue area if you have not been there before, and there's also information about the hotel. Additionally, over here to the left is the call for speakers. So if you are interested and qualified to be a speaker, you'll want to make sure that you get this filled out quickly. The submissions are due by the end of this month, so you have to provide all of the information. Make sure you read the tips on the left-hand side that helps you to understand the process and so forth that's involved here. Because we do have speaker panels that are going to be looking at all of the speaker submissions and helping us to select the best to make this the best conference ever. Also, you will notice that there are boot camps before the conference. There's a CWS CWT combined boot camp. I'll be teaching that one. And then there's going to be a CWNA, CWAP, CWDP, and CWSP boot camp as well. So all of these will be at the conference. And remember, both the CWAP and CWDP boot camps will be the brand new courses and certification. Okay, I think we accomplished it. So now back to the topic for the day. We're talking about alternate phis. So what are alternate phis? No, I didn't say alternate fries, which would be fries with cheese and chili on them or possibly ranch and bacon. Um, in this case, it's alternate phis, which is our wonderful abbreviation that we use within the network communications industry for the physical layer. So there are different physical layers. Now, it's important to understand that with wireless, when we talk about a phi, we do have to remember that when a new phi is released, it doesn't just change the phi. It doesn't just change the physical layer. So the 802.11 physical layer is divided into two components, the uh, PLCP and the PMD. The PLCP is the thing responsible for taking the MAC information, what comes down from layer two, and getting that ready for transmission by applying headers at the phi layer. 
And then the PMD is the thing, the physical medium dependent, it's the thing that actually is responsible for getting the bits out of the radio. And of course, receiving bits from the radio, stripping off the headers, passing it up to the layer two and so on. Well, the reason I say that is because there are values and information elements that are passed it, at the Mac layer that only apply to some of the FIs. And so therefore there may be alterations made at the Mac layer as well that are gonna apply to a specific physical layer implementation. So that's important to understand. That's why if you look at a FI amendment like 802.11 AD, which is DMG, if you were to look at that FI amendment, you would see it's not just the clause that defines the phi, but there are changes throughout other clauses as well. Okay, so I do want to be clear about that. But when I talk about alternate phi's, I'm talking about the uncommon phi's. So 2.4 and 5 gigahertz phi's are common, right? This is DSSS, which was there in the beginning, HRDSSS and OFDM, which were there as of 1999. ERP came along in 2003, HT 2009, and VHT just here a few years ago with 802.11 AC. And so those all work in the 2.4 and or 5 gigahertz bands. So DSSS, HRDSSS, and ERP, as well as HT are all 2.4 gigahertz. OFDM, HT, and VHT are 5 gigahertz. Now you'll notice the only one that's both was HT. So both of those work in both. So what are we talking about then? Well, we're talking about phi's that operate below 2.4 gigahertz and above five gigahertz, and they're less common. One of them is aptly named sub one gigahertz, the S1G phi. Another is the television very high throughput or TVHT phi. Both of those are down there under one gigahertz, under 2.4, okay? So they're down lower. Therefore, they have longer wavelengths, better range, things like that. And then when we go above 5 gigahertz, we're talking about millimeter wavelength, and we're dealing with 60 gigahertz. Now, it's actually 50-something gigahertz to 60-something gigahertz, but we call it the 60 gigahertz physical layer. And so that's directional multi-gigabit, or DMG. So these are what I'm referring to as the alternate phi's. Now, when we talk about these frequency bands, then the traditional Wi-Fi is in 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. DMG, which was 802.11 AD, is 60 gigahertz. And sub 1 gigahertz, or S1G, which was 802.11 AH is an amendment, is sub 1 gigahertz. I'm sorry, 802.11 AD is 60 gigahertz. Um, sub 1G is 802.11 AH, and it's sub 1 gigahertz. And then TVHT is also down there, we could call it sub one gigahertz, but it's different phi, different capabilities, different ranges, okay? So we already know the ranges for 2.4 and five. I won't go into the details there. 60 gigahertz, the range is actually 57 to 66 gigahertz. 802.11 devices use 57.24 to 65.88 gigahertz. So that's the range that they use. Sub one gigahertz, we say 700 to 950 megahertz, but it really varies by regulatory domain. So different parts of the world are going to use different sections of this frequency space. And TVHT, I mean, it can be from 54 uh, all the way up to 700, 800 megahertz. But again, it's going to vary by regulatory domain. So the actual ranges used vary depending on the regulatory domain that you're in and what's allowed to be used in those regulatory domains. So when we talk about these bands, Let's talk just about the bands without talking about the phi's. So sub one gigahertz, which would be S1G and TVHT. Your wavelengths are really long, 33 or longer centimeters, as opposed to 2.4, which is 12 roughly, and five gigahertz, which is roughly five centimeters. Uh, longer than 500 meters easily, depending on whether we're dealing with S1G, with low output power, or TVHT, where we can go many kilometers, uh, the point is that we can go longer ranges with lower output power because of the fact that we have these longer wavelengths. And then when you get to 60 gigahertz, we're usually under 10 meters. Now, uh, there are some strategies in place for an update to the 60 gigahertz phi so that we can get more range, but that's pretty well where it is today. 
So the use cases for sub one gigahertz, obviously IOT industrial, but think anything that's low throughput and long range and low throughput doesn't have to mean as low as you might think it does depend. And we'll get into those details a little later on. Whereas with 60 gigahertz, you're thinking short range, very high throughput. That's really what we're focused on here. Uh, high definition video Wi-Fi, for example, is a good use case of that. And we'll talk more about that. Right now in sub one gigahertz, the industry acceptance is pretty low, even still in 2018. But it's moderate for 60 gigahertz. Now, why am I saying that? Well, we can obviously say high for 2.4 and 5. There are millions of Wi-Fi devices out there in those bands. Sub 1 gigahertz has very few actual 802.11 devices that are out there today and being utilized. Although there are some regions of the world where it's starting to be implemented in various use cases. 60 gigahertz, I've listed it as moderate, and here's the reason why. I've listed it as moderate because we actually do have quite a few devices that are 802.11 AD capable that are DMG capable to use the specific PHI acronym. And so these include laptops that have 802.11 AD capabilities in them and other types of mobile devices. It includes uh, adapters for televisions. It includes APs that support it and so forth. So they are out there. The devices are there mostly in consumer space at this point, but Hey, that's where it starts, right? I mean, that's the first place we saw 802.11n stuff. It's the first place we saw 802.11ac stuff. And it's the first place we're seeing 802.11ax stuff. And that's not to say that no enterprise vendors are trying to do draft 11ax. They are, but enterprises tend to say, well, let's just hold on and see how good or bad or ugly this stuff works in the consumer space before we start putting it on our production networks. So let's talk about these S1G, DMG, and TVHT phis in overview then. So S1G was really only ratified in 2016. Uh, that's why you will not find it in the 802.11 2016 rollup. So the 802.11 2016 rollup has 802.11 AD and 802.11 AF incorporated. So they're just clauses in there. There's the DMG and the TVHT clause to define those phis. You won't find an S1G clause in 802.11 2016. It was ratified too late. So it is currently still only available as an amendment that would be beyond what's in 802.11 2016. We've already talked about the frequency bands where they operate. Um, the channel numbers for S1G are going to depend on available bandwidth. So some areas only have five megahertz total. And so obviously that's going to impact the number of channels that are available, given that we have channel widths of one, two, four, eight, or 16 megahertz. Clearly, if I've only got five megahertz, I could do a few one megahertz channels, a couple of two megahertz channels, one four megahertz channel. That's about all I have as my options. With DMG running in 60 gigahertz, this one is going to depend on where you are. There is one channel that is available in all regions. And it is therefore in most devices, the default channel used. That's channel two. It's a 2.16 gigahertz wide channel. That's right. You heard right. It is a 2.16 gigahertz wide channel. I know we talk a lot about don't use 160 megahertz channels. Most likely don't use 80 megahertz channels and only use 40 megahertz channels if you really need them in five gigahertz, for example. And of course, never use anything but 20 megahertz channels in 2.4 gigahertz. But here we are now. In DMG and 60 gigahertz, we're looking at 2.16 gigahertz wide channels. So they're very wide channels, allowing for the throughput capabilities that are offered over this short distance. There are actually four, one, two, three, and four, and we'll look at those in a moment and see some of the regions where they're available. Now, TVHT is between 54 and 790 megahertz, and again, it varies by regulatory domain. The number of available channels depends on unused white space in the area. I guess you could say the fewer TV stations you have, the better off you are as far as broadcast TV. Now, the interesting thing, though, is the FI, the TVHT FI, has to accommodate not only for the possible TV stations that might be in a geographic region or TV broadcasts that might be in a geographic region, but it also has to attempt to avoid interfering with other things like a, a microphone. 
So if you've ever worked with a wireless microphone, you may know that a lot of them work down in that range under or around 700 megahertz. And so we don't want to cause problems there either. So we do have clear channel assessment to detect uh, the energy that's in the channel in addition to some geolocation capabilities. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. The bandwidth is six, seven or eight megahertz in a single unit, uh, up to four units can be aggregated. And we'll talk about that. So on the far right, we're going to skip over the modulation because it's a bunch of acronyms and things that uh, it doesn't really have to be understood, but you do see it there if you understand those. The data rates are defined by MCS tables for all three of these. Uh, the IEEE kind of went to that when 802.11n came out and everything since then has stuck with this MCS table concept. So with S1G, your maximum data rate is 346,666.7, not megabits per second, but kilobits per second. So, you know, you do the math and you can realize that you've got a pretty low maximum data rate there. And that's with a 16 megahertz channel and four spatial streams. So a lot of these devices that might use this IOT devices are probably going to be battery operated and powered. And so we're going to use maybe only one spatial stream, maybe use a narrower channel. So we're going to consume less energy with our transmissions and receptions, and therefore our data rate is going to be much lower. I'm not going to go over every little detail of every data rate available in the MCS tables, but they are there in the standard if you want to take a look at those. And remember that some regions of the world only have 5 megahertz, so they couldn't do a 16 megahertz channel if they wanted to. DMG is also defined by an MCS table, and the max data rate is 6,756.75 megabits per second, or people round that to 7 gigabits. You'll see that all the time. You'll see vendor stuff saying, you know, this is a 802.11 AD capable of seven gigabits per second. Well, not according to the standard, it's capable of 6.756.75, <laughs> actually 6.75675 gigabits per second. Oh, I'm probably being picky there, but this is with one of the three um, modulation methods that are used. So there's OFDM 64 QAM, but it does also support a couple of other modulations for control and uh, single channel and different things like that. So they're in there, but they're lower. So I've went with the highest data rate for reference here. TV white space. Uh, if you have the maximum of 32 megahertz in channel bandwidth available to you, you could get 568.9 megabits per second maximum, okay? So there's kind of an overview of the capabilities of these. Let's now look in detail at each of these. So S1G, first of all, this is the one, we back up 802.11ah, right? That you may have heard about, uh, sometimes called Wi-Fi Halo, right? So this is, uh, here's the spectral mask in the lower right. You'll notice it looks like a pretty standard OFDM channel, but instead of being 20 or 40 or 80 megahertz wide or something, it's two megahertz wide, okay? Um, so it's a one and two megahertz channel width that are required. The standard requires any device that says it's an S1G device to support both one and two megahertz channels. This is called CBW1 and CBW2 in the standard, stands for channel bandwidth. Then Optionally, it can support 4, 8, and 16 megahertz channels, CBW4, CW8, and CBW16. Now, a 1 megahertz channel with a roughly minus 60 dBm signal can achieve a data rate of about 4.5 megabits per second with one spatial stream. If there are four spatial streams, that same channel could achieve about 17 megabits per second. This is using 256 quadrature amplitude modulation, that same modulation that was made so famous by 802.11ac. Now you do have to have a really good signal. I say roughly neg 60. The standard specifies closer to neg 58, but I'm just rounding it here for you. So you have to have a really good signal. And the key though is that because it's sub one gigahertz, I could achieve that 4.5 megabits per second at a much greater distance than I can even in 2.4 gigahertz. So I can get more range and still be able to use this 256 quadrature amplitude modulation, assuming no interference, the noise floor is right, you know, all of that good stuff, right? So this is a, a really interesting concept that comes into play and we'll summarize why that is later on. 
Now here's some details for DMG. Remember the channel widths are 2160 megahertz or 2.16 gigahertz. Um, free space path loss is neg 68 dB at one meter. Think about that. So, and that's a, a, a general average estimate for the whole range, right? From 57 to 64.8, 65 gigahertz. So for that whole range, a rough estimate is free space path loss in one meter is minus 68 dB. So it's losing power very rapidly, right? That's the big thing that we see there. Now, here we see the channel plan too. So remember I said channel two is available everywhere. You can see that very clearly here. Australia only has channel two at this time. China has two and three. Europe and Japan are the really only major regulatory domains that support all four channels. And the US and Canada support channels one through three. So this gives you some idea of what's available there with 802.11 AD. Now, the good thing is that only one channel for the consumer environment is not that big of a deal. Because unless you live in a duplex or an apartment complex, it's not likely that someone else's 802.11 AD system is going to cause significant interference with yours. If you have a house that is separated by even a few feet from the house next door with wall attenuation and so forth, most likely you're going to be okay down under even with one channel available. But now imagine one of the other use case scenarios, which is intra knock backhaul. So inside of my knock, interconnecting different racks or things like that with 802.11 AD. In that scenario, I probably do want a few channels. I don't want to put three different connections on the same channel in that room because then I'm going to degrade my throughput significantly. But if I could use channel one, two, and three, or channel two, three, and four, or just channel two and three even, then a scenario like that could be implemented and give me three or two good pipes within that space. So that's something our friends down under will have to work on to get more frequency space available if they want to have more than one channel and they want that use case scenario to play out for them, which by the way, I want to add, has not really played out in industry yet. It's just one of the use cases put forth by the original group that developed 802.11 AD, by a lot of white papers, by a lot of vendors that are releasing hardware and so forth. Now let's talk about TVHT. TVHT uses what are called basic channel units or BCUs. And these are six, seven or eight megahertz wide, depending on the regulatory domain. So within the standard, there's this terminology, TVHT underscore 2W, TVHT underscore W plus W, TVHT underscore 4W, and TVHT underscore 2W plus 2W. So what is this? Well, TVHT underscore 2W means there's two BCUs, six, seven, or eight megahertz each, combined together for 12, 14, or 16 megahertz that are contiguous. In other words, it's one block of 12, 14, or 16 megahertz. But W plus W means there's two non-contiguous BCUs. So this would be six plus six, seven plus seven, or eight plus eight. We still have 12, 14, or 16 megahertz, but they're separated by some frequency space. And then 4W is I have a full chunk of 24, 28, or 32 megahertz available to me. Whereas 2W plus 2W, I have one chunk of 12 and another chunk of 12, or one of 14, another of 14, one of 16, another of 16, and so forth. So the point is they're discontiguous or non-contiguous. Now, notice that I can't do four blocks, such as uh, a scenario where I've got W plus W plus W plus W, okay? I can't do that. So I can't have four separate six megahertz, seven megahertz, or eight megahertz chunks or BCUs. So if I want to do the four BCUs that are non-contiguous, two contiguous and two others that are contiguous, okay, is the way this is going to be implemented. Now, the way this works, because realize what we're doing is we're working in this place that's called TV white space. And what's it mean? It means that these frequencies had been set aside for licensed use by television stations. But as we're moving forward, fewer and fewer people over time are looking at broadcast TV. The end result is that even though there are still many rural areas that do not have cable, do not want satellite, and could watch broadcast TV, the cost justification for TV stations is going down, down, down. And so we are seeing a reduction over the years in the number of broadcast TV stations 
And even without that, we still had white space, space that wasn't used within a particular area. It might be used in another area, but not in this particular area. So how do we deal with that? How do we find out what space might be white? What space is open? It's not used by uh, broadcast TV or video. Well, this depends on something called a geolocation database or GDB in most domains. And the stations are what are called a GDD, a geolocation DB dependent. So two things, the station is dependent on a geolocation database. That's the GDD, the station. And then the GDB is the actual database. So the way it works then is devices can provide communication back to the internet such that a device can find out from it what the GDB says are white spaces in the area based on possibly a GPS chipset within the device or something like that, that defines the geolocation of that device. So there's that part, but then we also have to use clear channel assessment. So we got to make sure the channel's clear because there could be a microphone in use, even though the GDB says there's no TV station, it doesn't mean there's not something else. And it doesn't even have to be a microphone. It could be any number of other things that are communicating in that space. And so we need to make sure we're not interfering with that. So effectively, TVHT goes beyond SDR to implement cognitive radio solutions. And this is something that you see referenced in the standard just very briefly when it defines a white space device a wsd which originally was a european union term but now it's used pretty well universally uh, it says it's an entity that employs cognitive facilities to use white space spectrum without causing harmful interference to protected services now this phrase cognitive facilities used in the standard is not really further defined anywhere else in the standard but if you look at the standard and its requirement of GDB, GDD, uh, clear channel assessment and energy detection and things like that, then you come up with the realization that it's more than software defined radio, because technically you can call it software defined radio if you can define the frequency band it's going to operate on. So for example, if it can be 2.4 or 5 and you go in and manually say it's going to be 5 gigahertz, then that's a software defined radio. It's defined through your configuration and software to be 5 gigahertz, but that's not necessarily a cognitive radio. A cognitive radio uses cognition, right? Intelligent processing based on information gathered from things like a geolocation database and the RF energy in the area to determine the channel it should be using and the output power it should be utilizing and the channel bandwidth and all of that, okay? So that's all defined within TVHT. And here, by the way, we see an example of an MCS table for TVHT. So as we wrap up our discussion of these different phis, what are some use cases then? We kind of understand a little bit about them. Well, S1G is targeted at IoT, industrial monitoring, things like this. Think long range, low throughput and, and low output power too. Okay, so we don't have to have a lot of output power to communicate over say 150 meters or 200 meters because of the longer wavelengths we can receive those at the receiver with simpler capabilities in antenna design. And then TVHT has some unique use cases, um, but think long range medium throughput. So the throughput's a little higher, output power can be higher, uh, but the range is still long because we're down there sub one gigahertz. And there, there's been much discussion about using this for uh, WISP, wireless internet service providers for last mile, uh, if you think about it, if you could accomplish a one or 200 megabits per second link, or even a 50 megabits per second link, it's better than what a lot of people have now. So you go to a lot of rural areas and you've got nothing but either dial up, which I know is hard to believe there's still people that do that, or satellite. And satellite is still in this scenario where there are these exorbitant charges based on utilized data. And so it can be very expensive to use satellite like most of us like to use our internet, right? Free use of whatever, browsing, watching videos, learning about something at CWNP TV on YouTube. Okay, so whatever it is, we're used to just doing it, not even thinking about the data cost. Satellite users don't have that luxury in many parts of the world. So with TVHT, we could get a good 
signal into those rural areas. Even take a rural area that does have DSL, but maybe it's only six megabits per second. Yes, those areas still exist. Some are 10, some are 20. But the point is there are a lot of them that are six megabits per second or even three. The point then is if I can get 50 megabits per second or thereabout to that same area with TVHT, it makes a lot of sense. Now, as you probably know, DSL is probably going to have lower latency, meaning uh, if you do a ping test, right, the uh, duration, the round trip time is going to be faster than it would be on a TVHT link because of the necessary sharing of the medium and uh, the extra degradation in performance that you get as far as latency goes in just about every wireless implementation. Overwired, of course. Uh, and then, of course, DMG. So here we have consumer use cases. So we've talked about this. We've talked about, you know, take a, a laptop that has 802.11 AD, throw up your high definition video to a TV, both of them being connected to the AP or just connected directly with each other. And you get super high definition video with a wide bandwidth channel and high throughput. There are other potential use cases as well. I mean, we think 10 meters, so it's pretty well in room. Uh, that is going to work for a lot of scenarios and a lot of possible use cases. So there are a lot of possibilities there. Uh, intra NOC connections are another one of the use cases that are often put forth. And I mentioned this earlier, and the concept here is if I've got one server rack, I want to connect to another server rack, and I don't want to run some kind of cable, then I could use DMG. Um, and it could be that it would be challenging to run the cable in the room without going under the floor, above the ceiling, and it might be challenging to do so. Whereas if it's across the room, I could get a link across that room. Uh, so that's a possibility. That's something that we may end up seeing in some use cases. I don't think it's the most common because long-term, you're going to see a lot simpler long-term benefits and uses out of running fiber between those two racks than trying to implement something wireless like this. But do think short range, high throughput. Okay, that's really our target there. Short range, high throughput. And again, I want to emphasize that the goal is to extend this range. I mentioned at our conference last year that they are working on an update to the DMG5. And the goal is to go longer distances, right? Um, so, you know, I, I, I believe I said at the conference off the top of my head that DMG goes as far as you can throw a boat and the new version will go as far as you can throw a doghouse. But I'm not sure that was my analogy, but still the point is that um, they're aiming for greater distances out of DMG. And this is in part in competition with 5G. Okay, so to make sure we're keeping up on par with what 5G is capable of doing.